Good afternoon, chat. Um, it's a wonderful fall day here in uh, Canada. Um, but I just thought today's case we'd focus on osteoporosis, um, why we treat it, how important it is. So the clinical case I'll present to you is, is a 45-year-old female um, with uh, underlying type 1 diabetes. She's otherwise healthy. She's a non-smoker. She's a non-drinker. She's coming in for uh, a general physical, and she's just wondering whether she should be sent for a bone mineral density scan. So before we get into the details of that specific case, why, why do we care so much about treating osteoporosis? What's the big deal? I mean, obviously people don't you know, drop dead suddenly of osteoporosis. No one collapses suddenly into a pile of dust. Um, but osteoporosis is a really significant condition that we just don't take seriously enough. And if I have you just remember a couple of numbers, it would be the following ones. If you are 50 years of age and you fracture your hip, what percentage of people will pass away from that within the next year? And that number is as high as 20 to 30%. So generally quote about a 25% chance, which is really quite elevated if you think about it. Moreover, that specific risk carries forward for at least 10 years, the studies show. So it's not just the first year, but the second year, 25% chance, third year, 25% chance, which is really pretty incredible. Even more impressive, I find, from a negative perspective, if you're 75 years of age and you fracture your hip, what's the risk of you dying in the next six months? And that number is as high as 50%. So half of people will pass away within six months of having a hip fracture, which is really pretty astonishing. So this is why we want to prevent it as best we can. So before I leave those specific numbers, there's one other number I'd have you be aware of. Now, this is slightly different. We don't use it from a counseling perspective. But if your patients fracture their hip and they actually have surgery within two days, there's about a 5% risk that they die within 30 days. And the reason why I give you that number is because if that surgery is delayed by only up to two days, that percentage risk of dying increases almost double to 9%. And that's pretty significant. So this is one you want to be aware of as well. So you can either advocate for your patients or you're advocating for yourself or a, or a family member, whatever the case may be. But that's pretty astonishing numbers. So getting back to this specific case, who do we do bone mineral density scans on? And there's specific criteria that we look at. So essentially, there's three big groups of people who we do bone mineral density scans on, or at least offer the potential to do a bone mineral density scan. Um, and I say that specifically because if obviously the patient doesn't want that test, then that's absolutely fine. We just don't do it. But the first group is essentially any male or female over the age of 65 should be offered the potential towards getting a bone mineral density scan. The second group of people are those of us between the ages of 50 to 64 who specifically have an elevated FRAX criteria risk potential. And that criteria is greater than 3%. So that brings up the question of what is FRAX criteria, which I'll get back to in a second. The third group is anybody under the age of 50, so it doesn't matter so much what the age is, who have one of six conditions. So those are people who are either a primary hyperparathyroid patient, um, patients who have used an excess of glucocorticoids, and how do we define that excess? So that standard is somebody who's at had at least 7.5 milligrams for at least three months. And the reason why it's a number like that, that's the line in the sand but against which we compare all other levels. So if you had a patient who was on like 20 milligrams for two months, you'd probably order it. If you had somebody who was on really high dose intermittently through the year, you might order it. But that's the line where we compare things against from the standpoint of glucocorticoid use. Then you also have people who are either type 1 diabetics, who are hypogonadism patients, and, and what is it with hypogonadism that's a problem? The re reality is when your testosterone is low or androgen levels are low, um, we know for a fact that androgens will actually stimulate osteoblastic activity, which is the cell type that actually promotes bone growth, and it inhibits osteoclastic activity, which is the actual type that actually um, decreases bone density. So that's why that risk potential is there specifically. Um, and then the other group we look at is people who've had fragility fractures, so a sudden fracture of their hip or their spine. And the last group is malabsorption syndromes. And that's sort of an umbrella of, of anybody who has a condition that would inhibit the absorption of calcium, magnesium, or by its nature, the absorption of other molecules will affect the bone growth. And a lot of those are gastrointestinal conditions. So people with celiac disease would qualify and people with inflammatory bowel disease would qualify. So remember, inflammatory bowel disease is both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So if you have those conditions, um, and if you were in your 40s, you should have a bone mineral density scan done or at least have it offered to you. Um, so those are the three big groups we look at in terms of who we would do bone mineral density scans on. Um, and I mentioned earlier before, we look at specifically for the second group at what's called FRAX criteria. So there's two big um, 
scoring systems we use to determine whether you know, you're at risk from an osteoporotic perspective or whether you should have a bone marrow density scan um, done. And in Canada, we have the CAROC system, um, and that stands for specifically the Canadian Association of Radiologists and Osteoporosis Canada. Um, and then the bigger one that is more worldwide um, is the actual FRAX criteria. And what does FRAX stand for? It's the Fracture Risk Assessment, and the X actually stands for TOOL. Um, and I always think in my head that it's probably a tool who invented this system because I've never appreciated that. Uh, we have enough acronyms to remember, let alone one that doesn't actually spell out properly. So that one is actually probably the better of the two. It looks at a number of criteria to determine your risk of actually having a fracture. So it looks at your age, your sex, your height, your weight, and then it looks at a number of other criteria, including whether you've used glucocorticoids, whether you have underlying rheumatoid arthritis or a malabsorption syndrome, um, whether you're a smoker, um, whether you're a drinker, uh, those type of things. And you can certainly have scoring systems, which I have for the residents. So when people come in, we just score it and see what it looks like. But realistically, the ones you just don't want to forget about is the, the drinking and the smoking. So if you have a person who's a significant smoker and they're only like, say, 55 years of age, you probably want to be thinking about getting them a bone mineral density scan. Similarly, if you drink more than three alcoholic beverages per day, which is, is a lot, so obviously in a week you're having more than 21 drinks, but you'd be surprised how many people will hit that. And if you have the suspicion that it's there, I would probably, again, offer to get a bone mineral density scan done. So those are the groups in whom we actually do a bone mineral density scan in the first place. And that scan will then generate us what we call a T-score that'll show how strong their actual bones are. And normal T-scores run between zero and minus one. We almost never have conditions where you have too much density, your bones are too strong. Um, and essentially when you look at the parameters of bone density, from a statistics perspective, you can plot just about everything into what we call a Gaussian curve. Um, and the Gaussian curve will look at what is normal, and usually 67% of the population falls within normal, and that's the middle part of the curve. And then as you move away from normal, you get into what we call standard deviations off normal. And if you're one standard deviation off normal, you're what we call osteopenic, and that's on the slightly steeper part of the curve where the fracture risk is a little bit higher. And if you're two standard deviations off, and on the steepest part of the curve, then you're osteopenic osteoporotic and that's where we worry about fracture potential. So once we've generated that score we then look at well who are we actually going to treat. So if I get back to the CAROC criteria, the CAROC criteria then stratifies people into three groups. You're into mild, moderate and high risk. So if you're in the mild group, essentially that means that your 10-year risk of having a fracture is less than 10%. So that group will talk about lifestyle modification um, which we'll talk about shortly but we don't offer them pharmacotherapy. The moderate group, when you actually plug them in, their 10-year risk potential of actually having a fracture lies between 10 and 19%. So that group, um, some of them just do lifestyle changes, um, but some of them you'll actually offer pharmacotherapy depending on their underlying conditions, and that sort of overlaps with the FRACT criteria in terms of what those individual risks are. And then there's high risk, and those groups are at a 10-year risk potential of having a fracture of over 20%, which is pretty significant. And those ones should be offered pharmacotherapy. But if we get back to looking at the FRAX criteria, the ones we treat are divided into three big groups. So essentially, if you've had a hip or a vertebral fracture, then that group should be offered pharmacotherapy. If you are osteopenic, so your T-score is on that first standard deviation off and your FRAX criteria is greater than 3%, that group should also be offered pharmacotherapy. Or if your T-score is worse than minus 2.5, so you're more than two standard deviations off of normal. All three of those groups should be offered pharmacotherapy. Now, they may not accept it, which is absolutely fine, but we actually want to be offering that to them. But in concert with that, and with people who you just want to be talking about in terms of preventing osteoporosis, what type of advice do we give people? Um, so in general, from a lifestyle modification perspective, the two big ones that you don't want to forget about is if you smoke, we want to stop smoking. Um, smoking is one of the biggest modifiable risk factors for osteoporosis. The other big one is obviously alcohol intake. So if they're big drinkers, even if they just drink socially, you want to have a conversation about either stopping the alcohol or cutting it down significantly. And then alternatively, we also talk about um, calcium and vitamin D and levels that we're actually taking into our diet to help build our bone matrix up. So those standards in terms of how much we look at um, are, are as follows. So how much actual calcium should you be recommending for patients who you're worried about um, or you want to prevent osteoporosis? And the general answer is 1,200 milligrams per day. And how do we actually get that? So most of it is from food sources. Which of these following substances would give you the most calcium? So if I had you rank between a cup of yogurt, a medium-sized orange, a cup of orange juice, and a cup of milk, which one of these has the most calcium? 
So if I was to rank it, a medium-sized orange has about 50 milligrams of calcium, a cup of milk, and again, remember, it doesn't matter what percentage of milk, because the percentage is just the milk fat percentage, but a cup of milk has about 300 milligrams of calcium. A cup of orange juice that's been fortified with calcium has about 350 milligrams of calcium. And a cup of yogurt has about 450 milligrams of calcium. So the answer, the best answer there would be the cup of yogurt. And then we look at vitamin D supplementation. So how much vitamin D should you be getting? And the studies show us that you should be getting at least 800 international units of vitamin D per day. And how do we get that much? And you will have some patients who come in and sort of say, oh, I don't need any vitamin D, I'm in the sun all the time. Because obviously we produce um, vitamin D in our own systems when we're exposed to um, the sun. However, to get enough vitamin D for being out in the sun, you have to live in an extremely hot climate and probably be naked outside most of the day. Like it's, it's a lot of sun exposure. So you'll almost never get enough vitamin D from that source alone. So you have to be looking at supplements. And how do we get that in our diet? So the best source that we'll come across are actually fatty fish. So salmon would probably be the number one, followed probably by tuna specifically. Then after that, um, egg yolks are probably your next best source. And when you're looking at vegetable sources, the best source, and I think it's the only source, um, is actually mushrooms, um, and that's a good source. And then you get into fortified um, materials with vitamin D, so like cereals that are fortified with vitamin D, milk fortified with vitamin D, and orange juice fortified with vitamin D. So you want to certainly be talking to the patients about those for sure, and then you also want to be recommending that they increase their exercise, and the studies with Osteoporosis Canada recommend that they do three times a week for half an hour where they're exercising. And generally the most studied type of exercise that's beneficial for osteoporosis is some form of resistance training. So you gotta get your patients to be comfortable you know, lifting with their legs in particular because the femur is the, is the biggest bone in the body. Um, that doesn't have to mean it's at a gym. You can do you know, body weight exercises, wall squats, um, air squats, those type of things, but you could certainly be in the gym as well. Um, but the more they're doing that type of thing, the more they're building their bone matrix and you can't emphasize that enough to be quite honest. So if we get into the actual pharmacotherapy aspect of things, what, what medications do we offer to patients? Uh, so first and foremost, the one that's been around the longest is the bisphosphonate class. Um, so that's like Fosamax or Actinel. Those are the trade names of those medications. Um, those have been around for a long time. The problems with them is um, while they are effective, um, you can take them once a week, once a month. There's different versions that are available. The studies will actually show that the bone they deposit is good for the first five to seven years, but after that, it kind of becomes a brittle bone. So we have a limited amount of time we can be on those drugs. The other downside with them is they can sometimes affect the blood supply through the dentition. So if you have a patient who's on a bisphosphonate, and they're actually going to then have a dental procedure, you, you usually stop the medication uh, before they actually have the procedure, and then you start it back up slightly thereafter. The next step up in terms of better treatments pharmacologically, we start getting into biologics. Um, so monoclonal antibodies, there's something called, in Canada called Prolia, which is denosumab, which is an um, injection they get every six months. The data is really quite impressive with it. It's really an excellent medication. The downsides is when you look at the data, they have to be on it forever. Um, because if you stop it five, six years down the road, you can lose that progress relatively quickly. And you wanna make sure you're honest with your patients and say that. I find too often people just let that float and people just think, oh, I'm gonna be good forever. I can stop it in three years, I'll be fine. And you really can't. You have to be continuing with that one continuously. And then beyond that, you can also be on, there's a medication on that's called Avista, which is a CIRM, a selective estrogen receptor modulator, which has kind of a special niche. Um, they, they also use it in breast cancer patients, so there's, and it has a benefit on the bone as well. It's not nearly as good as the Proli is, but you'll find there's a subset of patients who might um, be on that medication because of other conditions they might be having. Now, beyond those three, there's actually one level higher than that, and this is reserved for patients who've either had a significant fragility fracture um, or their T-score is actually less than minus 3.5, and they would qualify for a drug in Canada that's called Evenity, or that is ro Romosozumab. It's another monoclonal antibody, um, and that one they take, um, I think it's I'd have to check. I think it's monthly. Yeah, I think it's monthly for a year, and then they convert bound back down to the prolia. And you want to keep that group in mind because, again, the studies will show that that drug for that year can really help build their bone matrix up. And so you don't want to miss that opportunity if patients fall into that category. So, again, getting back to our specific case, a 45-year-old female who came in with type 1 diabetes, would we actually order her a bone mineral density scan? And again, if you remember those three criteria of who gets a bone mineral density scan, she wouldn't qualify on age, 
Um, if we looked at it from the standpoint of the FRAX criteria and moderate risk between 50 and 64, she's obviously not that age range, so we wouldn't be looking at that group. So then we would fall into the third group, which is any age, you know, depending on which risk factors you have. And she has one of the ones where we would actually order the bone marrow density scan, which is the type 1 diabetes. So in that particular case, we would order or at least offer the opportunity to have a bone marrow density scan done and then see where the results take us from there. So um, that's the end of that case specifically. Um, we'll probably touch on this again in other ways because this is a very important topic. So digest that information and we'll see you later on the next one.